Welcome everyone. Today's webinar is Deck Frequently Asked Questions, Deciphering DCA6 and more, BCD 307. My name is Buddy Showalter and I'll be joined today by Lori Cook and we hope to have a, an informative session for you today. This presentation is copyrighted and uh, also accredited by AIA if you're looking to gain AIA credits. Hopefully you saw the description and learning objectives, but uh, thumbnail sketch is that we'll be looking today at AWC's design for code acceptance number six, prescriptive residential wood deck construction guide. We'll talk about some of the common challenges uh, faced with that. We'll compare differences to the International Residential Code. Look at some additional resources available uh, for wood deck design and construction and categorize code compliant components, deck components versus those that might require uh, separate approval by the authority having jurisdiction. So one of the first things that we'll do, just for those of you who may not be familiar with DCA6, is talk a little bit about its history and development. And then we'll look at some background uh, on the 2015 IRC, International Residential Code Deck provisions, uh, contrast the two. And then Lori will jump in and go through some of the frequently asked questions that we've received uh, over the years regarding this subject. But first, we'll have Marcy come and run our first poll and see who's with us today. Sure will. So what is your profession? Are you an architect, engineer, code official, fire service uh, member, or builder, manufacturer, or other? So, as usual, I will give you about 30 seconds or wait until about 80% of you have voted. So, and let's see if our afternoon crew can keep up with the morning. Morning was really fast, so, and you all are as well. So, I've got 80% and I'm going to close. And so let's see, we've got 58% engineers, 32% code officials, 6% architect, 4% builder, manufacturer, and others. So welcome to everyone. We are very glad that you're here. And back to you, buddy. Great. Welcome again, everyone. So here is a link to the uh, document, DCA6, on our website. And during the Q&A session, we'll take a look at some of the other resources on our deck page uh, and to make sure you're familiar with all the resources available there for you. Why is this important? There have been several deck and porch injury studies uh, done, but this one that we uh, looked at and are highlighting here indicates that nearly 15% of all deck-related injuries result from some sort of structural failure. And in, within that 15%, 60% of the structural failures are the deck connection to the house. And this photo that you see here uh, is pretty, unfortunately, pretty a pretty common failure mechanism for decks. A third of the structural failures relate to the railing. Dr. Frank Wiesty, uh, PE, retired professor from Virginia Tech, says that except for hurricanes and tornadoes, more injuries may be connected to deck failures than all other wood building components and loading cases combined. So this is important, and if we can move the dial, so to speak, in these two areas, the deck connection to the house and the railing, will go a long way toward dealing with uh, quite a few injuries that occur related to these uh, structures. 
So as an industry, um, about 10 years ago, as we were seeing more headlines from across the country where this was a problem, we decided to try and develop uh, some criteria to address this issue. And at the time, there wasn't a whole lot of information in the International Residential Code. Um, it primarily focused on the you know, the primary structure, the house, um, and didn't deal a lot with ancillary structures like decks. So we partnered with the International Code Council and we talked about not reinventing the wheel if there were some provisions already out there that were appropriate for um, deck design. So we looked um, to see what was available. We found that Fairfax County, Virginia, right here close to where we're located, had developed a pretty uh, detailed guide with a lot of nice graphics. And so we partner, also partnered with them, um, made the document uh, more applicable nationally, uh, to uh, all species that are available and used for decks all over the country. And it became a very, very, uh, very, very popular document. We also, along the way, uh, tapped into the expertise of other cooperators, other associations that represent groups or individuals that uh, are stakeholders in this area of uh, deck design and construction, uh, a couple of universities that had done some research in this area that we'll talk about in a little bit. And their input also was uh, useful in developing this document. So the way it's set up is that we base uh, as much as we can, as much as available, on the 2015 International Residential Code in this 2015 version of DCA 6. There are previous versions related to previous building codes. Within DCA 6, if you see bracketed text, for example, R317, R318 in brackets, that would indicate an applicable IRC section that we're either quoting or referencing in the D DCA 6 document. Any of the provisions in DCA 6, the prescriptive construction methods, are going to meet or exceed IRC minimum requirements. And if there are provisions in DCA 6 that aren't considered in I the IRC, then we call those good practice recommendations. But where any differences exist, the IRC is the code recognized uh, or, or the, the code that's adopted um, by local jurisdictions as the authoritative reference. This DCA6 document is n not a, an ANSI standard, uh, and so we get questions why, you know, why is DCA6 not referenced in the code? Well, we don't take that through the ANSI process, a lot of times you go that route, it ends up being even more conservative than uh, what it currently is. So we sort of have this uh, chicken and egg situation right now where some provisions of DCA 6 get picked up in the code and vice versa. We certainly do not preclude use of other construction methods or materials, and that's stated in, in DCA 6 and the, the IRC. And so code officials are able to approve alternate materials and methods of construction. So what we will do now is just talk a little bit about, as we started off talking about why this is important. We're going to focus in on the ledger and the rails and talk about some of the differences between uh, 
the IRC and DCA6. One of the first ones you may notice is that DCA6 no longer has information about hollow masonry units. It's just much too difficult with an existing structure to determine if those hollow masonry cells are grouted. Um, and if it's new construction and you can QC that grout going into the cells and know that that's uh, where your ledger is going to be attached, that's one thing. But um, there's just uh, not enough uh, visibility with hollow masonry to ensure that uh, you're going to get a, a good connection there. So we do have provisions for epoxy anchors into solid concrete or solid masonry, um, but not for hollow masonry. Then both the IRC and DCA6 have pretty specific details for the ledger to rim connection. There are lag screw and bolt uh, provisions uh, which are sort of the general off-the-shelf provisions for attaching um, the ledger to the structure. Again, we don't preclude the use of proprietary fasteners. We know there are a lot of fasteners out there now that are used, um, proprietary deck ledger screws and that type of thing. So that's certainly uh, suitable based on approval by the, the code official, but these are, these are the prescriptive, you know, off the shelf, you know, from the hardware store, um, prescriptive details. One of the things that's just a minor thing in the <laughs> IRC detail that didn't get picked up, and we'll have to make sure it gets corrected in the next version is this flashing detail. That flashing does need to extend all the way up underneath the uh, siding material. And then we also recommend that we get that flashing out over top of the joist hanger to you know just prevent additional water intrusion into the fasteners. Again, there are different ways to accomplish that, but this is really, this kind of detailing is very, very important. At first, Photo we saw uh, where we had a uh, that were, it showed a deck failure. A lot of these have to do with water intrusion into untreated wood in that rim board or something where we get wood rot and lose capacity with those lag screws or bolts that are through bolted into the structure. Also, I hope it goes without saying, but the code prohibit and DCA6 both prohibit nailing of these ledgers to um, the structure, and so um, that is very specifically a prohibition of both the code and DCA6. So what about the post to beam connection? Another very important uh, connection. Um, what we want to accomplish here is bearing of the beam on the post. And one of the figures in DCA6 shows uh, a, a prohibition of side nailing the beams on either side of the post with um, bolts. And the reason for that is because decks are in an outdoor application and you're getting um, moisture cycling with rain and sprinklers and who knows what else is you know getting the wood members wet and that moisture cycling called a wet service condition affects the capacity of the bolts and also can uh, lead to shrinkage and swelling and, and other things so what we do here is say let's get those beams bearing on the post and there are details that show bearing of the beams on top of the post and a post cap uh, connector. But again, if you have a, a, a designer that wants to engineer the bolted connection and, and uh, bolt those 
beams on either side of the post and take uh, into account the reductions for wet service conditions, then that's certainly uh, possible and can be reviewed by the code officials. But for a prescriptive document, which we have here, um, we're going to uh, require bearing of the beams on the post. The other thing that's um, in the residential code and also in DCA 6 are these uh, lateral uh, tension devices. Um, the 2015 IRC has requirements for two 1,500 pound hold downs at the corners of the deck and this is um, one solution. Uh, in fact, if you look at that note in the top right there, it says hold down or similar tension device. There are other solutions possible uh, for this application. Connector manufacturers have been doing this now for a decade and have developed all sorts of new um, uh, connectors. So this is not the only way, but it is one of the ways that shows up in the code and in our DCA6 document. Where we go a little further in DCA6 is showing orientation of the joists, which can either run parallel or perpendicular to those tension rods. Uh, also, we can f be framing into I-joist um, in addition to solid sawn, maybe even truss uh, situations, metal plate connected wood trusses. And so um, there are different details that can be used to meet this requirement of the deck. And one of those that also got picked up in the 2015 IRC is the um, detail of four 750 pound hold downs uh, in locations along the length uh, of the, of the uh, deck ledger to house. And so that is a an, another alternative now in the 2015 code that has not been picked up in DCA6 at this point. Our um, group, our task group that develops DCA6 is still evaluating that. And so we're working on the 2018 version of DCA6 right now. And uh, this is one of the items that we are looking at in that development process. So we'll switch now and talk a little bit about the guardrails and guard requirements. Once your deck height gets above 30 inches, a guard is required per the code and per DCA 6. And once that guard is required, there are minimum height provisions, uh, 36 inches measured from the walking surface of the deck to the top of the rail. And there are uh, connection requirements at the base of the guard posts to the the deck structure. And so we'll talk about those uh, here in a second. But one of the differences between uh, the IRC and DCA6 has to do with uh, adjacent fixed seating, adjacent to the uh, edge of the deck where a guardrail might be located. In DCA6, if you have this type of situation, DCA6 would require that your guard rail be measured from the seating surface and have a 36 inch rail uh, above the seating surface. And it's probably obvious that, you know, a kid uh, or even a, an adult that might not have, um, that, that might be enjoying themselves uh, up on top of that um, that deck seat um, could uh, flip right over the edge of uh, rail shown here, even if that's 36 inches from the walking surface. So where the 2015 IRC would allow this um, condition and, and would allow the measurement to be from the walking surface, DCA6 and the, the folks that developed that document felt it important to make sure that we have um, that rail 
36 inches above the seating surface. We talked a little bit about connecting that guard to the structure of the deck. There are a lot of different attempts to make this detail work to meet the code requirement. The code requirement is that the top of the rail resist um, a 200-pound concentrated load in any direction. Um, and so Virginia Tech and Washington State University both looked at this condition. And if you're designing for a 200-pound concentrated load, which we have attempted, the safety factor is already incorporated into the wood products and the connectors. However, if you're going to test to uh, a, a level like a 200-pound concentrated load, you need to build a safety factor into your test criteria. And so the only safety, not the only, the uh, safety factor that was identified as this testing was developed was one from the IBC, which um, is a two and a half safety factor. And so that's why in this diagram that you see here, where the code requirement's a 200 pound load, the safety factor of two and a half takes that. Um, much higher. And so when we, when Virginia Tech and Washington State started testing these types of situations, they found that the hold downs at the base, uh, they're typically used in shear wall design, were the only ways of um, getting um, that 200 pound concentrated load um, to be resisted in this configuration. And I'm going to ask Marcy to come and do our next poll, and then we'll, we'll delve in, discuss that just a little bit more detail. Absolutely. So, DCA 6 requires a 36-inch guard height measurement to be taken from the walking surface or any attached seating present. Is that true or false? And again, you all are very fast. It must be the sunshine. Hopefully it's sunny where you are. So it, I've got 80%. So 87% say true, 13% say false. And buddy, what do you say? The answer is true. So everyone was paying attention there. And that 36 inch guard height is measured from the seating surface if it's present or from the walking surface in DCA6. So very good, very good. So back to what makes it necessary to um, have those hold down devices at the base of the post. Um, and what, what about the practice of notching those fasteners, uh, or I'm sorry, not the fastener, notching of those guard posts, which is sometimes seen um, in construction. Tension perpendicular to grain is an Achilles heel of wood connections and wood members. And some of the initiators of tension perpendicular to grain include notches, large diameter fasteners, hanging loads, and shrinkage. And so when we show details like this, and we're focusing now at the hold down device that connects the guard post down here at the bottom to one of the um, joists uh, or blocking members, sorry, these, these are, uh, this is blocking between joists in the deck. One of the things we're trying to prevent is that tension perpendicular to grain uh, situation where the top bolt might be loading the top of that joist um, and creating cross grain bending in that joist member. Notching uh, is not permitted in these posts 
And so if you're seeing notches in these 4 by 4 posts, that is a no-no and, and should be flagged um, and addressed. Again, we're trying to deal with these life safety issues that we know are causing uh, injuries uh, in the field. And one of those uh, is the very important guard once we're more than 30 inches above grade. When we have um, the joist um, parallel, I'm sorry, perpendicular to um, the uh, rim and are connecting uh, guard posts in that way, uh, we can either connect directly to the deck joists or to um, deck joists on either side of that rim joist. This tension perp issue can also be problematic for ledgers. So we mentioned that if you have loads hanging from the bottom of a wood member, and I want to look, reference this diagram here on the left. And let's say all those lag screws were lined up in one straight line just along the top of the ledger. Well, that's creating a situation where now we've got the top of the ledger held in place by those lag screws. The bottom of the ledger is now loaded up with the joist hangers, and we've created a tension perp situation along the middle of that ledger. And so these details here showing the spacing, minimum spacing between um, bolts and between the bottom bolt and the top of the joists are very important as well, as is that five inch maximum spacing between rows of bolts to, to um, make sure that any moisture cycling that occurs where a ledger might get wet and then start to dry down and shrink could uh, the bolts then could try and pull that wood member apart as that ledger shrinks and so these details are important they were very carefully contemplated when we developed them for um, this document and one of the questions that came in the last um, uh, webinar we did on this subject had to do with step downs. What if we have a four inch or six inch step down like we show here? Um, how, what are the ramifications there? Well, the ramifications are you still have to be able to fit all these bolts in the ledger, in the cross section of the ledger and the cross section of the rim and still meet all these spacing uh, and edge distance requirements. So it can get kind of tight to meet those requirements depending on the depth of your ledger and the depth of your rim. So if it gets too tight, you'll probably need an alternate solution like um, a non-ledger deck where you've got posts supporting um, the, the end of the deck by the structure rather than the um, ledger. So I'm going to stop there um, and bring Lori on to deal with some of the FAQs, and then we'll take time at the end today to work through Q&As that have come in during the session here as well. So, Lori? Awesome. Thank you, buddy. All right. Let me get my screen changed over for everyone here. Okay, good. So, Buddy talked a lot about the DCA-6 and um, the, the requirements that are in there in, in the IRC. For the second half of today's presentation, I'm going to do more of a kind of a question and answer where we're going to address uh, some commonly asked questions that we get, have gotten over the years uh, so that you'll see on, on the slides here we have a question and, and answer format. So the first question that we see very frequently asked is in Table 2 in DCA 6, why does the overhang span sometimes increase as the joist spacing increases? So if you look at this illustration uh, below, you'll see that for a, a span that's 12 inches on center, 
the, the allowable overhang is one foot. And these are for uh, southern yellow pine spans. If you go then, if you increase the spacing to 16 inches on center, the allowable overhang increases from one foot to one feet one inch, and then it increases again at 24 inches on center. So this seems a little counterintuitive. But to really understand this, you, re you need to understand the, the limit states that are used in developing this table. So for this table, a uniform load on the joist never determines the allowable span. There's, there's the limit state for a deflection um, uh, due to a point load at the cantilever, uh, at the end of the cantilever, or the maximum of one-fourth of the main span, or the span between the supports, like you see here. So under a single point load, the deflection at the overhang will decrease as the main span decreases. So for many cases in the table, allowable overhang spans are shorter because of the fact that the allowable main span is longer. So where it appears that the overhang spans are inconsistent with the joist spacing, this is the, the increased deflection of the overhang controlling. Where the overhang deflection doesn't control, the overhang spans are limited to one quarter of the main span, and then they do tend to appear more consistent with joist spacing. So really, it's it's not a difference in anything. It's just kind of where the, the limit state switches from one controlling to the other. And there is an FAQ on our website that details this rather explicitly, so you can check that out as well. We're going to try in our next version of DCA6 to make this table a bit more user friendly. So this is a version of the table that's going to be in the next version of DCA6, the 2018 version. So this is a special uh, sneak preview for you guys. This is, this is like um, getting a, a special uh, end credit scene for the next movie or something. So for the next version of DCA6, we're going to change the format of this table uh, because it has caused some confusion. We, we did believe that we improved the format of the table in 2015, but we're, we're finding that it's still not quite perfect. So we're, we're tweaking it again. Uh, so this new format changes the assumption by not having the cantilever linked to the joist spacing, but rather to the, the length of the main span which has a larger effect on the allowable cantilever. This format has also been proposed for the 2021 IRC, uh, and it's been seen as a positive change by many people in the industry, so you should uh, keep an eye out for it in coming editions of standards and, and supporting documents. The next question is, why are the beam spans three inches longer in the IRC than they are in the DCA-6? So if you look at the tables we've, we've shown here, uh, the first one is from the 2015 IRC. This is table R5076. Uh, and it just shows our beam span length, maximum allowable beam spans. Table 3A on the bottom from the DCA6 also conveys the same information, but you'll notice that the IRC has spans that are three inches longer. This has to do with how span is defined in the two documents. And we're going to look at a picture here that picture is worth a thousand words. So in the IRC, we use engineering span, which is the center, the distance from the center of bearing to center of bearing. So in this case, the IRC assumes there is an inch and a half of bearing on each end of that span. DCA6 uses what's known as clear span. So that's a lot more uh, appropriate for somebody that is not necessarily doing an engineering analysis, but might be trying to measure a face of support to face of support. It's a, it's a lot easier measurement when you're out uh, on site building. So the, the clear span in DCA6 does not include that bearing. The IRC spans do. So there's really not a difference in the span. It's a difference in how they're defining span and what they're including in it. So we choose in DCA6 to not include the bearing. It's only that face of support to face of support measurement, which you see defined in the bottom illustration there. 
Buddy, I think, addressed this. We do uh, use a lot of 6x6 six six posts in DCA6, and that is one of the spots where it differs from the IRC. The IRC does have 4x4 four four posts allowed. So we do have some provisions for very limited use of 4x4 four four posts in the DCA6 commentary. You can see here in this table that they are limited in terms of height, so you're not going to get much taller than about four feet with a 4x4 four four supporting post. But for a small deck, that might be enough. So this would be something that you could use a 4x4 four four post. The table you would uh, use the table the same way that the tables in in the main body of the standard is of the document is used. So we're gonna take a break, and Mar Marcy's gonna come in and give us the next poll. Yes, I am. So the measurement of beam span being I can't say it beam span is the same in DCA six and IRC. Is it true or false? Ooh, the majority are saying one answer. All right, I think everybody was listening. So. Good. Everybody's really on the ball today. Yes, they sure are. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and close. And 91% say false. So All what right. do you say? 91% of you are correct, it is false. So. It, Again, that's just the, the definition of span uh, and the measurement of span do differ between DCA6 and IRC because IRC uses that engineering span, whereas DCA6 is only using the clear span or that face of support to face of support. The next question is, can I notch a 4x4 four four guard post based on the DCA6 provisions? And it's a one word answer, no. We actually have it in all caps in the illustration in DCA6 in figure 24. Um, do not notch this post. It will compromise the load carrying capabilities of the post. Uh, Buddy alluded to the fact that you need to have, you know, 200 pounds of, uh, of resistance on that, that guard connection. Uh, it, and it is a common spot for deck failures. So we, we do not, uh, allow notching of the post when you're designing per DCA6. The next question is, does DCA6 have provisions for alternate soil conditions? We do, they're in the commentary. So many of you are probably uh, in situations where you say, you know, my, my soil bearing capacity is a lot higher than that 1500 PSF that is specified in DCA6. That's uh, that 1500 PSF that we specify is a minimum. Uh, it's assumed to be pretty crummy soil. So if you're in an instance, in a situation where you've done some soil testing, you know the capacity of the soil is higher than 1500 PSF, you are able to go into the commentary and based on your soil bearing capacities, you can select an alternate footing size. Uh, you know, based on your, again, it would be read the same way as the table in the main standard or in the main part of the document. Um, and it would, you would just follow it based on your soil capacity. Next question is, how do you design a beam with joists framing in from both sides using DCA6? So in DCA6, you'll see in table 3A, it does state pretty clearly in the top, it's for beam spans for joists framing in from one side only. So we want to, if we want to have beams frame, joists framing into the beam from both sides, we need to use an equivalent tributary area. So for this example, if, if for example, in the DCA6 commentary we show, we have joists that are eight feet long framing in from opposite sides, we would need to use the 16 foot column here for our evaluation of our deck beam span. This provides us an equivalent tributary area as, uh, as it would at the eight feet times two, the 16 feet. But you do wanna take a look at the posts and the footers to ensure that they have adequate capacity uh, depending on the, you know, your, your member sizing. 
One question that I get very commonly is, is, if my deck has a roof or is covered in any way, should the wet service factor, the C sub M factor it's known as, be applied in the design? If you go into DCA6, you'll see that DCA6 does assume the wet service factor for all lumber properties. It assumes it for all connections. So it, it the assumption in DCA6 is that the, the deck is going to have moisture content in excess of 19% for an extended period. That language is what tends to trip people up though is that what qualifies is an extended period if i have a roof on my deck it's going to be protected somewhat so when in doubt we tend to assume the worst case scenario and apply the the wet service factor so even if a deck has a roof there are ways that it could get wet you can have wind driven rain um, you can have you know a, a child with a garden hose there are, there's lots of very plausible ways that the moisture content of that structure could be above 19%. So we, we think it's better to apply the wet service factor and be conservative rather than to not and have a potential situation where you have an unconservative design. Now, before there were deck provisions in the IRC, and before DCA6 was invented, there were still decks. There are many decks out there that were built before the, those provisions were enforced. And even if they were built in accordance with DCA6, it's still important to evaluate a structure throughout its lifespan. So the resources for evaluating an existing deck are, you can use the, some of the provisions in DCA6 CA6 to help you. There is a, a good checklist that we, we uh, recommend from the NADRA, the North American Deck and Railing Association, so you can check out their website. There's also the Manual for Inspection of Residential Wood Decks and Balconies. That's published by the Forest Product Society. So those are both very good resources that can help you ex uh, evaluate an existing deck regardless of, of what provisions it was designed in accordance with. You see here in figure 18 we've got a big no symbol where we have an attachment to a house overhang. So why does DCA6 prohibit the attachment of a ledger to an overhang or a bay window? Typically in situations like this, th these overhangs are uh, created by cantilevering your, cantilevering your floor joists. They are typically not designed for the additional loads that a deck would impose on them. So you would need to do one of two things. You would need to either have a full engineering evaluation of the structure be undertaken to determine whether or not it could safely support that, that ledger. Uh, that ledger attachment, or you can use a non-ledger deck, and that would be a, a deck that is st vertically, structurally independent from the house. Another question we are frequently asked is, what is the live load assumed in DCA6? Uh, we assume a 40 PSF floor live load, and that's in conjunction with the, the residential requirements of the IRC. Some of you may have uh, been familiar with the ASC 7 requirements for balconies that do require 100 pounds per square foot. So that's that would not be, that would be outside the scope of DCA 6. So this is only for 40 pounds per square foot for residential structures. If you have a snow load that's equivalent to 40 pounds per square foot, you can use DCA6 as well, but that's only for a uniform snow load. So if you have drifting snow on your structure, that would be outside of the scope of DCA6. So you would need to have an engineer take a look at that structure as well. And as nice as this hot tub looks on this deck, you would not be able to design a deck with a large concentrated load like that per DCA6. We know that water weighs 62.4 pounds per cubic foot, so it is a very large load when you start getting things like hot tubs and, and other 
large bodies of water on top of your deck. So you would need to have that designed uh, as part of an engineering analysis and ensure that it can support that large concentrated load. All right, we've got one more poll here for everybody yes, to jump do. into. Thank you. Yeah. All right, DCA6 has restrictions or prohibitions on heavy concentrated loads, attachment of the ledger to a bay window or overhang, drifting snow loads, or all of the above. Maybe we've made these questions too easy because these folks are on fire. All right, so we've got 80%. Let's go. Great. And so 95% say all of the above and just a little bit elsewhere. And right. tell me those 95% are right. They are right. It is all of the above. So we talked about how DCA6 has uh, doesn't allow for heavy concentrated loads like, like hot tubs. The attachment of the, the leg your two bay window or overhang, you know, having to do with the the cantilever floor joists, and then drifting snow loads would be outside the scope of DCA six. We we would accommodate only up to forty pounds per square foot of a ground snow load or uniform snow load. But that's awesome. Glad to hear most of you got it. Okay, moving on. This is something that that has. Uh, given a lot of people a lot of heartburn over the years, I think. Can a ledger be connected through a brick or stone veneer? And as you can see in this illustration, this is an uh, example of what can happen when you connect a ledger through a, a stone veneer where it's not really appropriate. We have a large crack that has developed all through this ledger. So that means that this ledger doesn't have any load carrying capability anymore. Or, or certainly not the amount that it, it's supposed to. So where you have exterior veneers like brick, masonry, and stone, those are typically not load-bearing. Uh, there are connectors out there that, we, that we've been you know, made aware of the presence of that will allow for the accommodation of, of a deck ledger around a veneer but you will need to verify the, the capacity of those connectors. And the, those are typically proprietary, so you wouldn't find those in, in our document here. But in general, you don't want to crack the ledger or the veneer. And if you do connect through one of these veneers, that typically those are the two outcomes that you typically could expect. So we do want to steer clear of connection through a veneer like that. So a non-ledger deck would be the best solution, uh, absent some other sort of specialty hardware in this instance. Next question is, should I install knee braces on interior deck posts? You'll see in figure 10 here, we show knee braces only at the corner post. And that's because the interior posts have a higher gravity load than the corner posts. They have a larger tributary area, so the, the gravity load is higher. And uh, 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 inducing additional lateral load in those interior posts could lead to an overstress. So in general, we do install knee braces on the corner posts only. The diagonal bracing does does contribute to the stiffness of the deck, but it does, like I said, cause additional lateral loads on those posts. So in in, in a case where you your interior posts, they're going to only be loaded, loaded axially. Your end posts with the knee braces are going to have axial and bending load, with bending load coming in from this knee brace there. So because, again, that, that end post has half the tributary area of the interior post, we have less axial force, so we can accommodate more bending force. But we do want to stay away from that at the interior posts. We have incised lumber sometimes when we're using treated lumber. But for incised lumber, when you're designing with it, there are sometimes span reductions and and uh, other reductions taken when you incise the lumber as part of the pr uh, preservative treatment process. So this C sub I factor is the incising factor that is used in 
reducing the, the span. We apply it to the species where it is necessary. These are called the refractory species, and that's going to be Douglas fir larch, hem fir, and spruce pine fir. Southern yellow pine does not require incising when it's treated because it very readily accepts the treatment chemicals. So that one does not require an incising factor. You will not need to imply, apply an incising factor to any of the, the beam spans or anything like that in DCA6 because we have already taken care of it. So if you are using treated lumber, there's no need to worry about any sort of reduction if you are using incised lumber. We've handled it as part of the development of the document and no additional uh, reduction is necessary. All right, if you have fasteners in wet conditions and preservative treated wood, how do you accommodate that? You'll see in DCA 6 in a lot of places we recommend threaded fasteners, either screws or, or deformed shank threaded nails to help resist uh, the fastener backing out through wetting and drying cycles. You'll also see that the IRC does have uh, language on corrosion resistance in R317.3. We do, in DCA6 at AWC, we do uh, remain consistent with that. So for, for fastenings, for like screws, bolts, and nails, you have options, hot dipped galvanized, stainless, silicon bronze, or copper. For hangers and anchors, you're, you're going to be limited to probably galvanized and stainless as your acceptable offerings. If you are in a saltwater exposure, you'll need to use all stainless because the, the salt will eat away that, that galvanized fasteners and, and uh, hangers and such. So you do want to, if you're in a saltwater exposure, specify stainless steel fastenings. If you're using other fasteners or other hardware or proprietary things, the DC6 does not uh, restrict those, but you will need to have it approved by your building official or authority having jurisdiction or whoever is doing the approving for your, your project. So these lateral load devices have caused a lot of questions because they are new. So if you have a deck where the deck joists are perpendicular to the floor joists of the house, you have a, we have a figure here, figure 23, that shows that you do need to supply six feet minimum of blocking uh, through the joists into the house. You'll also see that this, uh, this rod here is sloped slightly downward for drainage purposes because you are penetrating through the exterior of the house here. So if any water were to make its way in, sloping the rod does help prevent that from, from uh, getting further in, in the house. So there are ways to comply with it. Now this is intended more for the, the two hold down at 1,500 pounds capacity each. The newer version, the newer standard requirements will specify four hold downs with a capacity of 750 pounds apiece. And there are several proprietary solutions out there that are available that can satisfy that and you can install it from the exterior of the house with lag screws and other simple fasteners. So it doesn't require uh, quite as much uh, of this intrusion uh, that you see here into the, into the main structure. And our last frequently asked question is, is there a Spanish version of DCA6? And the answer is yes. So I think Suzanne is going to share the, the link for that on, in, the, in the chat box there. But we do have both the 2012 and 2015 versions available in Spanish. And we do anticipate that when the 2018 version is ready that we will have that available in Spanish as well. Now, so we have one last poll for everyone. All right, so the wet service factor is applied to all lumber properties in DCA6. True or false? Hmm. 
Okay, we've got 80%. So 79% say true, 21% say false. And what say you, Lori? I say true. So we, we have applied that C sub M, the wet surface factor, to all of the lumber properties in DCA6. We assume that the structure is outside. It's going to be getting rained on uh, so that it will be, there will be periods where its moisture content will be in excess of 19%. So that was good for you guys that got it right. All right, now we're going to wrap it up here with just a, a few resource, a few more resources here at the end. And, um, and then we'll have some Q&A, so don't, don't go anywhere just yet. I know we're getting cl close to the top of the hour. The summer 2013 issue of Wood Design Focus is the, an entire issue that was dedicated to wood decks. And several articles in this uh, issue focused on lateral design and, and lateral loading on decks. Uh, and you can see in this illustration here, we there was some experiments done at, a, at, I think, Washington State University where they quantified occupant-induced lateral loads on decks and compared them to seismic and wind loads. And they found that the occupant-induced lateral, lateral loads were substantially higher than seismic loads and wind loads. Uh, and it does make sense because the, the deck is a very light structure, so uh, the seismic loads associated with the light structure would tend to be lower. And with a, a wind load, the deck doesn't have much of a, a vertical profile, so it's not providing a lot of wind force. So the lateral load from occupants is actually quite high. So this is what has led to some of these changes in, in the standard, uh, in the codes. And I'm sure as we learn more about this, it will continue to be refined. But if you are interested in, in reading about this, I suggest you check it out. It's, it's really interesting stuff. And then lastly, we do have a couple of downloads. We do ask if you are a building department uh, and you would like to use our document in your jurisdiction, please don't post the actual DCA6 to your website. We have this one pager that you can post on your website. You're free to link to DCA6, but we ask you not to post it because that way if we do make changes or corrections or, or anything, um, that way they would get picked up uh, and you would not have to update your website accordingly. So we ask just link to us and we'll handle keeping it up to date. All right, so and that is all I've got. Buddy and I will take some Q&A. Yes, so um, we actually received a few questions prior to the webinar, and so I'll uh, tackle a couple of those, but I thought I'd start here um, with the uh, deck page, the deck web page on our website. So that's what you're seeing here. You're seeing the DCA 615 version here on top. Uh, there's a link to the English uh, version and the Spanish translation just below that. Um, there's a link to the one pager that Lori mentioned. And then there's some additional resources below for the 2012 version, some of the other resources that we mentioned earlier, and some of the other um, online courses. And then some of the FAQs that we've dealt with here today are also captured on that page. So that's uh, the first thing we'll, we'll talk about. Second thing um, we'll talk about here is carriage bolts. So we get a lot of questions about carriage bolts. So for you de designers out there, uh, code officials who are doing plan check, um, the carriage bolts are not uh, incorporated into the NDS. But there is an, an ASME standard for those uh, types of bolts that give the dimensional tolerances. However, the bending yield strength is really what you need to try and determine. Um, so that's been the that that's been the uh, sort of tricky part is finding a bending yield strength that can be used with the NDS. 
uh, equations. Uh, but as an engineer, if you want to make some judgment calls on that and design uh, with carriage bolts, it's not precluded uh, in the NDS uh, or in DCA6. So it, we just don't have any prescriptive provisions for that. So that would have to go through the, uh, through the code official. So let's see. Oh, deck ledgers was the other thing, Lori, real quick. Um, so we're not endorsing um, any sp specific proprietary connectors, but the question came up about uh, what types of hardware might be available out there for uh, working around brick and stone veneers. And here are just a couple of pictures that were sent to us of some products that are out there in the marketplace. You can see how it holds the ledger off of the uh, side of the house a, a, a sufficient distance to allow for brick or um, stone uh, veneers. These would have to be evaluated either per the manufacturer or evaluation reports and approved by the uh, local code official. So. Just again, we're not endorsing products, just telling you that there's some products available out there. Um, Lori, could you talk a little bit about um, hidden fasteners? There, there have been questions about hidden fasteners used to connect decking to joists. What's, what, what's the deal mm -hmm. with that? So, like any any other proprietary product in the DCA six, you you want to make sure if you're using hidden hidden fasteners that they will transfer the loads properly. Uh, so you want to make sure that the fastener can adequately transfer any shear. It'll resist any withdrawal. Uh, so it it is important it to have the either the manufacturer's literature that sh shows that it's an approved product or third-party evaluation report or, or something that shows that it does indeed meet the, the load requirements. So you aren't prohibited from using them, but you do need to do a little extra homework to make sure that they will carry the loads appropriately. Yeah, so I'm going to try and answer a couple of other questions related to that here, too, in, in mm -hmm. this group. Um, mm -hmm. So decking can stiffen up the structure, especially when it's oriented at a 45 degree angle to the joist. Okay. So if you look at our wind and seismic standard, we've got capacities for board sheathing. If it's perpendicular to the, to the joist or rafters, it has a certain capacity. If it's at a 45, that capacity increases, I think, as much as four times. And so if you've got face-mounted decking with screws or nails, then you've increased the stiffness tremendously just by orienting the fasteners at a 45. But those hidden fasteners that Lori just talked about um, may not have that positive connection. They may slide through the slots on the sides of the wood plastic composites that they're often used with. So then you couldn't count on your decking for stiffness. We've already talked about knee braces. So then what about the posts? Well, figure 12 that you're seeing here on your screen is various types of post connections. And you see the, the, th the two on the left are above ground and require a positive connection. But that connection between the post and the concrete is not necessarily a moment connection. So you've basically got a pin connection there at the base, unless the hardware manufacturer has given you moment capacities or, or moment type connectors. The uh, third one from the left there is embedded in the ground. Uh, you know, it's below ground. Depending on how far below ground, you might begin to get some moment capacity with your post there. Uh, you still need a positive connection to the um, to the concrete there in the base. The one on the right then gets us a little bit closer to a moment 
resisting system uh, in, at the base of the post. And you see there's a gravel footing there. This um, allows water to move through um, and not puddle uh, around the post. Uh, you'd have end grain uh, at the end of your post, and if water is pooling up down there, if you've got concrete underneath and you've just set that post down in a, in a pool of water, then you may get water up into untreated portions of the post. Um, and so this allows water to move through and not be trapped around that, around that post and gives you some uplift capacity, as you can see with the, the rods there um, that would be embedded before you pour the uh, before you pour the concrete. So that also relates, Lori. I'll take this one, and if you have some others that you're seeing, um, I'll turn it back to you. That also relates to porch design. So folks are uh, sometimes asking about porch design. There's some similarities to deck design. Really, we're kind of talking about the same uh, load path here. Either your posts are going to be your moment resistance if you've got lateral loads on your porch, or you have to get the loads through the roof ceiling diaphragm of the porch back into the structure. So if you were to design your ceiling as sort of a, a cantilever diaphragm, and get that connected back into the floor system, assuming it's you know in the same uh, plane as your floor system, same type of connection uh, requirements, like those 1,500 pound hold downs or the you know, the one the hold downs distributed along the length of the of your porch roof. Um, that's that would be a uh, similar approach, but nothing has been codified yet, to my knowledge, for those types of porch applications. So, Any, <clears throat> Sorry, there, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of questions here, buddy. People asking if there are uh, ways where you do not, if you are ways out of applying the, the t lateral tension devices or if there are any exemptions to them. Um, I do want to make it clear to folks that those are required in the IR. See, so uh, unfortunately, there's there's no workaround. Yeah, um, they they are they're they're resisting lateral loads, you know, in 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 the direction of the you know the, the joists. Yeah, the knee braces are resisting lateral loads in a different direction. Yeah, uh, so one doesn't replace the other. Yeah, and again, it's kind of related to this whole post discussion. Since the posts, in a lot of cases, are considered pinned at the base, uh, we don't have a lot of moment resistance there. Uh, depending on which way your decking is oriented, you can't necessarily count on the decking to provide a lot of lateral resistance. And so that picture that Lori showed of the students on the deck in that Wood Design Focus article the research really does show that um, you get people loads on the deck and they um, get moving to the beat, uh, the music, and it and it's all um, it's all fun and games until the uh, until the deck comes down. And so you need some sort of lateral device uh, if your posts aren't carrying it, like a post frame building. If your decking's not carrying it, then those devices are what are going to hold that deck um, in place. The lag screws are really, in the ledger, are just carrying vertical load. They'll have some withdrawal resistance, but they'll, they'll unzip like a zipper um, with those big lateral loads that you can get on the end of a large deck. All right. Well, I think we're about 10 minutes past the hour, so All right. I'm... Well, about ready to sign off here. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us today, and we uh, hope to see you for next month's webinar as well. Have a good day.